Okay, so in our second video and our last video for today, I want to introduce some of the concepts we're going to be thinking about in today's lecture on assessing performance. So how do we look at a model and understand whether or not it's a good model or not? We talked a little bit about this with the quality metric, but we want to go a little bit deeper. So here is that recap slide I just showed you, kind of everything we saw about linear regression. Um, I'm not going to go over this now because I just went over it in the last video, but this is a very helpful kind of one snapshot view of everything we saw on day one. Okay, so now I want to talk a little bit about assessing performance and what do I mean by that? So remember in the last video when I was introducing this notion of polynomial regression, I said, yeah, you can extend linear regression using extra features where they have polynomial expansions of your input. You can make a degree one polynomial or a degree three or a degree zero if you want, or go crazy and go degree 32. And I asked you, and I said I couldn't answer that quite yet, how do you choose the right degree polynomial? So let's consider that question. So consider one data set, but using many different degree polynomial models. So on the far left one, I train a polynomial of degree three. And then on the right one, I train a polynomial of degree four, and then degree five, and then degree 20. And we mentioned on Monday that a really great way of trying to define the quality of a predictor is use something like the residual sum of squares. So find which one has the smallest error. So of these four, which one has the smallest error? Well, if we could think about what the residual sum of squares is doing, it looks at every point, finds the distance between that point and the predicted value, squares it, and adds it up. Now, it looks like in terms of this graph, the one that's closest at, for, to most of the points is this degree 20 polynomial. Very high degree polynomial gets very, very close to all the points. Now, this might seem that minimizing residual sum of squares might not be the whole part of the story. Because if we're just trying to find something that minimizes residual sum of squares, then it only will help you to use the highest degree polynomial you can. Like if you use a, P, a polynomial of a degree 45 or something, let me use a different color, you could get like this kind of up and down, balancing about, hitting every single point perfectly. And in that case, it could potentially have zero training error on the data we gave it if it's able to perfectly match every point. And with how polynomials work, if you give them enough flexibility, they can eventually fit every single point if you allow it to bounce up and down a lot. More degree, higher degree polynomial, more degrees of freedom can bounce up and down more. And so this would then lead to the conclusion that if we're trying to minimize RSS, we should always use the highest degree polynomial possible. But that might not always be the case. It might not be clear why, but let's consider that. So why do we train ML models in the first place? We train them because we want them to do well on future data. Like we have that training set and that's all cool and well and good, but we generally are using it as a tool to train a model. We don't care about that data set in particular, we care about the future. And if we choose a model that minimizes the residual sum of squares on the data it learned from, we're just going to choose to favor a model that's able to memorize the data it got, not one that necessarily generalizes well. So if we just consider minimizing RSS on the data we have, we'll just choose the model that's the most complex, has the best ability to fit every single point in that one set. In which case, it's not necessarily learning, it's just memorizing the data you gave it. And that may or may not predict well in the future. And I always like to think about this concept as thinking about like studying for exams. Just because you can get 100% on a practice exam that you've been studying for hours does not mean you, th you should think you get 100% on a real test. You may not have actually learned any material. You might have just spent a long enough time in that one practice exam to memorize all the answers in it. And the same thing can happen with machine learning models. If you get, make a model that's sufficiently complex for the data set you have, it could potentially just memorize all of the points you gave it, and it would get really good error, or really low error, 
on those examples because it memorized them, but the second you give it something else, everything would fall apart. It'd have no idea what it's doing. And so the key idea is that we wanna actually change how we assess our model. That we wanna assess the model based on something we learned about general trends in the data so that we can get a good estimate on how we'll do in the future rather than just on that one data set we got. So how we do that is gonna be a bit tricky. So let's think a little bit about what do I mean by future performance? It's a little bit abstract. And this slide in particular is gonna be a little bit mathy, um, but it's more about the idea that's really, really important. So here is the key idea to thinking about future performance, future performance on all future data we might encounter. Well, the way we do this is we think about this mathematical construct called the true error. This is the tr true error you'd incur if you deployed the model into the wild. And to understand what I mean by true error, we need to understand that there's uncertainty in the world. Namely, there's uncertainty in what square footage house we might be looking at, that not every square footage house is equally likely to appear as any other. Um, and also, for a particular square footage, there's a range of possible prices you might see. Now, that claim as actually shouldn't be surprising. That's a direct result of the fact that we're using models where we said yi is equal to f of xi plus epsilon. The range of possible outputs for some particular input square footage, say 100, is random. There's just some distribution over them. So there's a distribution over the price for some fixed input. And there's also a distribution over the possible square footage you could see. Now, what we're gonna do is try to define the true error. Now, in order to do this, I have to define one other quantity. What I'm gonna define is what we call a general loss function. Or sometimes called a general quality metric. And the idea here being I'm defining some general function L that takes the true label Y and the predicted label F hat of X and outputs some score for that prediction. So we've already seen this notion of a general loss function. One specific one is the residual sum of squares. Uh, so we used the loss or label Y with prediction F hat of X. This is going to be equal to y minus f hat of x. Okay, that does the little line thing. All that squared. The reason I generalize this to this abstract notion of a loss function is this applies in lots of different scenarios. So if you're using other loss functions, this applies. So we actually like this idea of an abstract loss function. It gives a true label and a predicted label and outputs some number saying how wrong it is. And this, this discussion works for any of them, not necessarily to squared error. So then what we're going to do is we're going to define the true error as the expected loss. So what this is, is it's the expected amount of loss we would receive, where this expectation, this expected value, is happening over all possible x, y. And this notion of distribution over x's and distributions on y is given some x is really important because not all square footages are equally likely. And so it might be okay if your model's a little bit more wrong on square footages that are completely impossible to happen like a negative two square foot house, right? You, don't, might, you might not care that your model is incorrect there because it's not very likely you'd see such a house. In fact, negative square footage is impossible or theoretically impossible. And just to give you a sense of how this is defined, this really is just kind of like an expected value over every possible X you can see, every, over every possible Y you can see, the loss you would incur, using f hat on that x and y times the probability of seeing that x and y. If you haven't seen this notion of what we call a joint distribution before, that's okay. I just really wanted to show you that it's really just this weighted sum 
weighting the possible losses so over every possible X and every possible Y you could see, weighted by that probability of seeing that particular X and Y. And that is the notion of true loss. That's the big idea. True loss is the expected loss you'd receive. We don't care actually how we can compute that. And it turns out it's okay that we don't, if you don't understand how to compute that, that's okay. Because you can't actually compute this thing in practice. Right? So if we want to assess, uh, whoops, um, what I meant to say, go back there, there we go. Um, in order to actually compute this true error, what you would need is an infinite amount of data for all possible, possible values you could see in the future, all X's and all Y combinations. But an infinite amount of data is generally hard to come by. Right? You, you don't really have any infinite data sets out there. So this true error is a useful construct in theory, but is not actually able to compute in practice, or generally you're not able to compute in practice. But it's still our goal to try to minimize this true error. We want to find a model that minimizes the expected loss in the future. But we need some way of trying to estimate that expected loss without actually having access to all possible data we can potentially see in the future since we're just never going to come across that. So we're going to consider this tool called model assessment, which lets us identify or lets us talk about how to assess how a model might do in the future. It lets us estimate this quality. So how can we figure out how well a model will do on future data if we don't have access to future data? We'll try to estimate it. And what we'll do is we'll try to hide data from our model training algorithm and then use that held out data as a stand-in for all, oops, I didn't mean to hit my mic, sorry about that, all future data. So we'll withhold some data and use that as a proxy for all of the future data we could see. And we'll use our error on that held out data set as an estimate of future performance of the true error. And so the way this is most commonly done in practice, there's many ways of trying to do this, but the most common way is we divide our data into two sets, a training set and a test set. And the training set is the one you use to train the model. And the test set is the one that you use to estimate the performance in the future. So for example, you might leave as, I'm gonna color in some points here. You might select randomly these points to use as your training set. And you train a model using just the blue points. Then take the predictor you learn from that and assess it, estimate its true error, the future error, using all the points in white that we left out. <clears throat> and the hope is, if you have a big enough test set, it should be a good enough estimate of the true error. This is generally a thing from statistics. If you have a larger representative sample, you could get a better and better estimate of the quantity of interest. So we're using the test error to estimate what we think the true error is. So kind of formally, the way we talk about this is we think about the test error as being an estimate of the true error. We're gonna to try to guess or get a good sense of what the true error for a predictor is without having access to the infinite amount of future data. And so we'll define the residual sum of squares on the test set as being just the residual sum of squares, but only looping all the values that ended up being in the test set. Same idea, just sum of errors, but only looking at the ones in the test set. And importantly, this test set is never trained on. You withhold it from your training algorithm. It can never look at it. And the hope is if the test set is large enough, then we can approximate the true error. And these videos are getting a little long for today, so I only have one more slide I wanna show us before we wrap it up, which is how big of a test set do you need? So if we're using this test set to estimate future error, how big should it be? So in some sense, a bigger test set corresponds to a better estimate of true error. This is a general statement. 
assuming your test set is representative of kind of the future data, um, which is generally an assumption we have to make. Otherwise, the whole point of training on model that's not or data on that's not representative is kind of pointless. We generally assume our data is representative of the future. And if you have a bigger test set, then you get a better estimate of the true error. But withholding more data so that you can keep in your test set comes at the cost of reducing your training set size in the absence of not being able to just go collect more data, which is sometimes possible, but sometimes not. And so if you're withholding training data, you might not learn that good of a predictor. So won't learn as well. What I mean by that is suppose I had, gave you a data set with two data points in it versus a data set with 100 data points. In it. Which one would you be more confident in the predictor that you learn here? Would you be very confident that this is a straight line with just two points versus would you be confident it's a straight line with 100 points? Really, for this kind of two-point example, it really could be a line, or it could be cubic, or quadratic, or really anything. But here, if you see this line pattern, it's most likely a line. The more training data you have, the better you'd feel about your model. The more training data you have, hopefully, the better it will learn in the future. And so there's this trade-off here. The more training data you have, the better the predictor is, or hopefully the more data it learns to be a better predictor. But the more data you have in your test set, the better estimate of the true error you might get. That makes you more confident in the model that you learn or the predictor that you learn. When you say it's going to get a 20% error on the test set, you're much more confident that that 20% is much closer to the true error rather than just some fluke. So in practice, Generally, people do about 80% train, 20% split uh, test, or 90% train, 10% test. This varies in a lot of different contexts, but that's generally what people tend to do. And importantly, a huge important point is never, ever, ever train your model on the test set. You must withhold that forever and only use it to assess the model at the end. Now, in class today, we'll pick up right here where I left off. And we'll talk a little bit more about this idea of training and testing and talk about this idea of trying to find the right model complexity. And that's going to be our focus um, in this second lecture.